please stand for our call to worship. Over the years, I've shared this uh, passage with lots of people, and uh, one time when I was sharing it, it struck me that the end of verse 5 is the key to the whole passage, so you see if you agree. This is God's Word. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Again, the fact that the Lord is near, that changes everything. Amen. Let's continue in worship as we sing, Rejoice, ye pure in heart. As we uh, prepare to sup together around the Lord's uh, table, uh, this uh, passage makes me very thankful that Jesus died on the cross, not just in general, but died on the cross specifically for me. God's Word says, You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And our prayer of confession, uh, we'll be uh, saying that uh, together. It'll be on the screen. Uh, before we read it together, we're going to have a silent uh, moment uh, to confess our sins to the Lord uh, privately. Almighty God, who has set your law of love ever before us, we ask your forgiveness for any and every way in which we harbor any resentment or ill feeling in our hearts toward others. And for when we refuse to seek the way of reconciliation and peace, according to the example and teaching of your eternal Son, Jesus Christ, whose compassion embraces all peoples, and who in the day of his earthly ministry welcomed sinners, we also confess our tendency 
to replace your call to be perfect with our attempts to do our best and justifications for such failings. So forgive us and receive us who now come to you in humble confession and repentance and who have nothing to plead but our own exceeding need and your exceeding love. Living, reigning, triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And then praise the Lord for uh, God's grace in His Son, uh, Jesus Christ. Our assurance of pardon comes from Titus 2, starting with verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Praise his name. Please be seated. I certainly do want to thank those of you, many of you have prayed for my daughter for a lot of years and poured your life into her, maybe children's ministry, youth ministry, um, 
keep praying. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you hear it said that it takes a village to raise a, a child. Better than that, it takes a faith community to raise a child. And so thank you. As we prepare to give to the Lord, Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 13 says this. This is God's Word. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Pray with me. Father, the the fact that we are considered your friends is just blow us out of the water. And the fact that you sent your only son to to lay down his life for us is absolutely amazing. And so, Father, may that be the the only motivation that we need with, with great willingness, great excitement, great love, great get to great want to, to give a small portion back to you, our time, our talents, and our financial resources. Father, help us to do so with great joy, with great expectation, and that you would take these gifts and use them, Father, to help us as a church to point people to Jesus, because that's what it's all about. God's people said, amen. Please be seated. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word that we can sing, we can read, we can hear, and we can meditate upon, which your Holy Spirit brings to our mind again and again to direct us and encourage us to teach us, to reprove us, 
all for our good and your glory. So give us ears to hear what your spirit would say to us today as we read your holy word. In Jesus' name, amen. We come uh, to the gospel of Matthew, which we will be in for a while. And we're at the Sermon on the Mount, the fifth chapter, the Gospel of Matthew, and the beginning of one of the significant blocks of teaching from Jesus we find in the Gospel of Matthew, the Word of God. Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain, and when He sat down, His disciples came to Him, and He opened His mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Amen. Have you ever seen the, the uh, motto, salt life? If you haven't, that means you drive around like with your eyes closed. It's on trucks and cars and uh, we see it on apparel. It is very common. It's, uh, it's described as an ocean-centric apparel brand. And indeed it is. It was founded in Jacksonville in 2003 A.D. And the salt life name and style are spotted regularly and often throughout Florida and far beyond that. Jesus' life is a Jesus-centric way of life describing a disciple or follower of Jesus Christ. It was founded in Judea about 30 A.D. And the name as such is not recognized worldwide, though FPC, we adopted that tag several years ago. The style or the design of Jesus' life though not known that way perhaps, may be found throughout the world. Growing from the backwoods of Judea over the last 2,000 years. The Sermon on the Mount is the first of these five major blocks of the teaching of Jesus Christ uh, found in the Gospel of Matthew. It's rightly considered the classic statement of the ethics of the kingdom of God, of which Jesus will exhort in the middle of the sermon in uh, chapter 6, verse 33, that this is the first priority. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. First priority, He makes it. And this is a statement on the ethics of the kingdom of God. That word is important, not the values of the kingdom of God. Our culture talks a lot about values, but the difference is this. Ethics are uh, really moral obligations. There are ethics to certain uh, practices. Physicians have a moral ethic that says the very first thing, their first priority is what? Do no harm. If your doctor says, well, I don't really hold to that, find another doctor. I think it's okay to do harm sometimes. It's kind of fun. No, that's not good. It's a moral ethic. Values change with culture, with people. Well, this is my value today. Tomorrow, this is my value. 
this is a more expedient value right now. Normally, not stealing is good, but today, it seems to be okay. Same with lying. What's the story about lying? The Sunday school boy was asked about lying. What is it? It's an abomination to the Lord and a very present help in times of trouble. That would be misapplying (laughs) what Scripture says. So we're talking about the ethics of the kingdom. They don't change. And Charles Spurgeon, commenting on the very first verse that Jesus went up on the mountain, says it was suitable that such elevated ethics should be taught from a mountain. Because they are. The ethics of the kingdom of God are high. The standard of God is high. So how do we understand and apply the ethics of the kingdom as presented here? Over the years, the church has taken different views. One, that they are to be interpreted literally, but they're only to be applied to a special class of Christian, kind of the monastic class. Think the monks that separate themselves entirely for spiritual work, that it would apply to them, but not to the garden variety Christian. That would be one interpretation. Others have said it applies literally to every Christian, literally, in this sense. Uh, Others, that it's uh, really a heightened view of the law of Moses. So, Moses gave the law, Jesus comes, and as we'll see as we work through the Sermon on the Mount, many of these ideas continue to come up, and Jesus applies them. But it's heightened in that Jesus says, if you're keeping the outward parts, but you're not keeping the motive of it, you've still violated the law. And Martin Luther was understanding this as he understood the law, that basically that this was even more to point us to our great need for Christ and grace and a Redeemer. And still others understood it as focusing on the inner dispositions, but not so much the outer conduct, that if you had your inner disposition that I want to do the right thing, even if I don't, but it, I wanted to. And so we look at this. What, what helps us to understand it is if we recall to whom it was originally directed, the disciples of Jesus, and through them to the whole church who would be followers of Jesus today. And the Sermon on the Mount addresses both inner motives and outward conduct. But they're really strict. You heard the call to confession at the end of this very chapter of Matthew 5. So be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. No problem. No, we we hear that. We know no one can completely obey the ethics of the kingdom. We don't live up to that standard every day, 24-7, and it drives us then to take refuge in the grace and mercy of God in Christ. And yet, the ethics of the kingdom of God, we also are to take them to heart as followers of Jesus who are committed to doing Jesus' life. That is, to having a a Jesus-centric life about us. That the first thing we are concerned about is Jesus and whatever we're dealing with. And so we're going to invest the summer in the Sermon on the Mount and be working our way through that. And we'll see Jesus unfolding these ethics as, as well as the standards that Jesus lived daily. So demanding, indeed perfect, that we're called daily to seek God's grace and mercy and to look to Jesus and to His cross and, and to the gospel of Jesus Christ and remember that. The statutes that we find at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount uh, are benedictions. They're actually words of blessing. Blessed are occurs nine times in the opening of the Sermon on the Mount. Makarios is the word, blessed. It's present tense. Blessed are now. And yet aspects of it are so grand that they will only be fully known in the future fulfillment of the kingdom. Sometimes it's translated as happy, be happy. You may have seen that and 
and, and read that, and it's, it's not a bad translation, but it's more than that. Happy very much gets caught up in feelings or circumstances and situations, but blessed encompasses that idea and, and, far, and far more. And so blessed is really the, the best word here uh, for us. Um, it encompasses the idea of, of spiritual well-being, uh, of knowing this, that we are accepted, that we are loved, that we are approved, that we are included in Jesus Christ the King. Amen. That's the idea here. Then Hebrew, the blessings are known as barakah. And Matthew is writing to a primarily Jewish community. And they have embraced Jesus or Yeshua as the Messiah. And so these blessings here are a virtual description of the life situation of Jesus' earlier followers in the Galilee area. What's being described here is how they are living. This is what they are facing and yet they also announce that there is a great reversal, and it takes place because of the coming of the kingdom of God. And as we look at the Beatitudes, um, we see that there's some bookends here from the very first one through verse 9 that are the, uh, or through verse 10 that are the poetic section. There's a, uh, a rhythm and a pace to the Beatitudes until the verse 11, that last one, and we'll look at that. But verse 3, the, the promise is, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And verse 10, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's the blessing, the kingdom of heaven. Jesus' teachings never contradict the blessings of the Sermon on the Mount. They often are expanding and expounding on them in some way, with direct application to life and life situations, but they're the ethics of the kingdom. They're the ethics, really, of His rule and His reign, and this is how we're to live if we're living a Jesus life, a Jesus-centric life. Blessed are the poor in spirit, He says. Being poor in spirit is really basic to the Christian testimony and life. The kingdom of heaven is never about deserving it, meriting it, earning it. Never. It's about our recognition of our spiritual poverty and that we fall on our own very fall, far short of God's standard of holiness, of righteousness, of goodness. Be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, and then come on in. Uh, no. And we would have no hope of attaining it by our own righteousness. And this is where we all start, with God. Spurgeon likened it to the first rung of a ladder. And as we recognize our spiritual poverty, then we're in a place to receive God's grace and His promises. As long as we think we're pretty good, and I can think of 12 people right off the top of my hand, I'm better than them, so I know I'm not the worst person in the world, and we go through. No. And so we mourn our sin. And we mourn the condition because of our sin. And blessed are those who mourn, he says. So the context is primarily the mourning over our sinful rebellion against a holy, just, and righteous, and loving God. And so we cry out in repentance and confession, even as Jesus taught in his parable in Luke chapter 18 about the, uh, the tax collector. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. We cry out that way to the Lord. 
and trusting in Christ alone and His righteousness that is applied to us by faith, the kingdom of heaven, Jesus says, is ours. And so we mourn over our sin and we repent of it. We mourn also over the evil that we see and that we experience around us because of sin. What a comfort. Indeed, that's what Jesus says. For they shall be comforted. And the ethics of the kingdom are ours to obey and ours to follow if we would live a Jesus life, a Jesus-centric life. The, the blessing... He goes on in verse 5, the meek shall inherit the earth, and those who have a great desire for righteousness, verse 6, shall be satisfied. So what does it mean to be meek? It's not to be weak. Jesus was meek. He was not weak. It is to be gentle. It is a strength that is under control. And our pattern for meekness It's always Jesus. Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. He prays, if there is any way that this cup, meaning the cross and the sufferings of the cross, could pass from me, but if not, your will be done. He submits to the Father's will. And and far from a mercy that leads us... uh, 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 to a a laxness about sin, whether our own sin or the sins of others, we're stirred to hunger and to thirst for righteousness, for God's righteousness, for what God defines as right and good, not our own ideas, not our culture's shifting ideas of righteousness or rightness, but what God has said. As we look at the Beatitudes here, it's similar to the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, are not for us to pick from. It's not like going to the produce market and saying, I'm going to have a pear and a banana, but I don't really care for plums. It's the fruit. It's actually one, the fruit of the Spirit. And all of these are to be developing in a follower of Jesus. The Beatitudes, likewise, are not for us to select. select. I like number five and seven. The others I'll get to eventually. No, therefore, all of us as followers of Jesus, they apply to us. And so as we hear these, we would see that God's Spirit would be working all of this in us. The fifth benediction, verse seven, the central blessing is really a bit of a shift from the persecution the followers of Jesus are having to the call to mercy, to be merciful. The concept of mercy, uh, the Hebrew word is hesed, is a defining characteristic of God in the Old Testament. Yes, in the Old Testament. That idea of that God in the Old Testament was really mean, but the God of the New Testament is really nice, is a falsehood that's been perpetuated, and it is wrong. Hesed, mercy, loving kindness, a steadfast love characterizes God throughout the entire Scriptures. Matthew records Jesus confronting the Pharisees twice with the words of Hosea, Chapter 6, verse 6, we find it in Matthew 9, 13, Matthew 12, 7, and he tells the Pharisees, who are the experts in the law, to discover what this means. I desire steadfast love that is mercy, that is hesed, and not sacrifice. And the first occurrence actually happens in Matthew's house. Hesed, this steadfast love, this mercy, is always reciprocal. If we're shown mercy, we're expected to do what? Show mercy. Jesus taught a parable, we'll get to it in chapter 18, about the unforgiving servant who had been forgiven a little or had been forgiven much and then confronts a servant who owes him a little 
and will have no mercy on him. Showing mercy does not mean that we have a love or even a tolerance for sin. Beginning with ourselves, Jesus said that's always where we're supposed to begin, that we would be poor in spirit, that we would recognize our own poverty before God's standard of righteousness. But if we have a love for sin, if we even say, well, I'm going to tolerate X percentage of sin, that flies in the very face of the ethics of the kingdom of God, the kingdom that Jesus is here announcing as blessed. But having received mercy, and particularly forgiveness from God in Christ, we are to be people who are merciful to other sinners. If we say, well, I'm going to be merciful to other saints, that's well, not so hard most of the time. But to other sinners, I'm going to be merciful. It's not easy, but it is the work of the Holy Spirit in us that the ethics of the kingdom would not just be here, but it would be a Jesus life that He's developing in us. The next benedictions here are, are on a, a positive qualities, pure in spirit and peacemakers, verses 8 and 9. And what is the reward? God is the reward. Beloved, God is always the reward. God is not the means to the reward that God's pretty good, but if we get God, then we get the reward. God is the reward. God's the best reward that we have. And we first see God through the inside or through eyes of faith, but Jesus assured His disciples that in seeing Him, they had seen the Father, John 14, verse 9. And when we are glorified, God's children will see Him as He is, 1 John 3, 2. Meanwhile, because that hasn't happened yet, the ethics of the kingdom call us to be active as peacemakers. We saw this in Romans 12, 18 as well. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. And so... The idea here is both there's a passive sense, don't stir hostilities and divisions and dissension, but more than that, be a peacemaker. Take action to bring reconciliation, to be a peacemaker. That's what Jesus did, that's why He was here, to make peace between a holy God and sinful human beings. The Beatitudes returns to the idea of righteousness in verse 10. Not only are we to hunger and thirst after righteousness, as the earlier Beatitudes said, but understanding the reality that those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, those who pursue it, those who would dare to be peacemakers, can expect to be persecuted for righteousness' sake, verse 10. The promise is the kingdom itself. Don't give up. Don't back down. Don't change the ethic. The poetic structure there ends at verse 10. And as we come to 11, the blessing there focuses on the situation that Matthew's hearers and readers would know very, very personally. For it says in verse 11, that you are blessed when you are reviled and persecuted. To be reviled means to be insulted. That they will have all kinds, he says here, of evil things said about them because of their relationship to Jesus. And this has been true in various places throughout the world for over 2,000 years. It's increasingly true in our own life situation. The early followers of Jesus were sometimes called atheists. They only had one God. 
They denied the pantheon of Greek and Roman gods. They were atheists. Sometimes they were called cannibals because of the very thing we're going to do in a few moments. I heard they drink blood and they eat flesh. And you run with that and you tell others, don't check it out for yourself. Just spread the rumor. And it spread. Because had they come, they would have found that there was no blood drinking going on. There never had been. But there is the sacrament of Holy Communion. We are called to know it is about the blood of Christ shed for us and His body given for us. The blessing here is to encourage us to not be surprised and to not give up when persecution or slander or worse comes our way. Indeed, as implausible as it may sound, it is an occasion, he says, for rejoicing and gladness because the reward is waiting, the very reward that is the goal of the kingdom. Jesus came, comes back to what's the key issue of importance here. He wants them to remember who they are and whose they are always. It's about identity. He reminds them and He reminds us that our identity is not in the present um, precarious persecution. It's not in mourning. It's not in the insults that we may bear for Jesus' sake that we are citizens of the kingdom of which Jesus is the king. And he says that this puts us in the company of the persecuted prophets who led the way before us. Verse 11, that our identity is linked in with Isaiah and Jeremiah and Daniel and Hosea and Malachi and the other prophets of old. That's your identity. And all of this, Jesus' followers, then and now are reminded that what we desire and what we work for here will only be fully and finally realized in the kingdom of heaven. And in the meantime, Jesus says to his disciples then and now that we can expect some measure of pushback from the world regarding our ethics and our lifestyle, including personally. We can expect that if we're leading a Jesus life, a Jesus-centric life. And if we're not at all, If we're not experiencing any of that at all ever, the passage gives us pause to consider whether we are living out Jesus' kingdom ethics. Because if the world is lockstep with us about everything we say and do, either we're in heaven or we've forsaken the ethics of the kingdom in places. Salt life is a motto, and it's a patented trademark for a company. If you don't think so, try to include salt life into something you're doing without permission. Even sun life won't make it. Those who wear the merchandise, however, do not have to like water. They don't have to like the beach or fishing, or surfing, or anything connected to the ocean. They're not going to ask you, do you like the ocean? I mean, we don't sell our product to people who don't love the ocean. Can you swim? They just want you to buy their merchandise. Jesus' life is not merely a motto. Jesus' life is to ascribe Uh, ourselves, link ourselves inextricably to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of uh, sinners, the, the King of the everlasting kingdom. It does matter whether we are committed to Him. 
and love Him. It starts with the awareness that we are poor in spirit, that we are in total spiritual poverty apart from Christ. We call out to Him in faith. We come to participate even now in the blessings of His kingdom. As we live out the ethics of His kingdom, and we are aided in that, and we are reminded of that as we come to the Lord's Supper that He has made available to His followers to encourage us and help us to live the Jesus life. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word, and we look forward to our time in the Sermon on the Mount, hearing the words of Jesus being reminded of the ethics of the kingdom, of how He fulfilled them, and how we find our fulfillment in Him. We pray Your blessing over this table, over Your Word, as it would take effect in our hearts and in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus set forth this table for His followers And it's an invitation for all who would participate in the Jesus life. If we still think of the Jesus life as kind of a motto like salt life, it's something to wear but not really do, then I would encourage you not to receive. But if following Jesus and longing to do that more and more consistently and better and live by the ethics of His kingdom, then this is for you. Or in the salt life in the ocean, if you're like, you know, I still need floaties on to swim in the ocean, but I like it. We would say salt life's for you. I still need a lot of help to live the Jesus life. We all do. This is part of the help that we come and receive. So I would urge you, if you desire to live the Jesus life, to participate then in this sacrament that He has given to His body, His church. The apostle says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that in the night in which He was betrayed, the Lord Jesus, after He had given thanks, took bread and broke it, And he said, this is my body. It's broken for you. Do this as often as you eat it and remember me. And then in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it and remember me. For when you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Even here, he's telling us, look for the kingdom. And in the meantime, live for the kingdom. And I will help you every step of the way.
1 Corinthians 5, we read, For Christ, a Passover lamb, was sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Again, Paul was saying, because of Jesus and His sacrifice for us, an atoning sacrifice, let us live by the ethics of the kingdom. The body of Christ, the Passover lamb given for you. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood given for the forgiveness of sins. As oft as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me.
Gospel of Matthew, Jesus was asked, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The Jesus life is a high calling. It's a joyful calling and certainly reminds us of our utter dependence upon Him, the sweetness of Christ. Pray with me. Father, by Your grace, help us to think of the Jesus life as not something that we have to do, but something that we get to do. It's a calling to be like Jesus, to be less like ourselves. And so, Father, give us the discipline again by Your grace to get to know Him at a deeper level, to learn how He thought, to learn how He spoke, to learn how He acted. And Father, again, we need more and more and more of your grace to do that. So we thank you for this time around your table. And as we become less like ourselves and more like Jesus, that people would take notice and want to know what's different about us. Again, by your grace, give us a boldness to share with them the beauty of the gospel and that you would draw them to yourself. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please uh, stand for our hymn of response, Lord, I want to be a Christian. I didn't see them earlier, but the 
uh, I didn't know which service they were coming to, but Scott and Amy are here with us. Scott and Amy Smith, um, starting Faithful City Church in St. Cloud, Minnesota. So they're back here. Raise your hands. And I would encourage, if you want to learn more what's happening with Faithful City, what's going on in Minnesota, what's going on with them, uh, they're going to be right there so you can connect with them and find them and encourage them. Are you all going to be at the next service too? Okay. So um, we're glad. So uh, check on them. Receive the blessing, the benediction. It's as if Jesus said, blessed are you by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. May that rest and abide with you all now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.